Welcome to the Holiness Today podcast. I'm Stan Reeder, Regional Director of USA Canada, and we are partnering with Holiness Today to feature preachers from across the region. We hope these messages will encourage your daily walk with the Lord and help you feel connected with our region. I think probably we count things that are important to us. Do you agree? Well, okay. I'll, I think that we count things that are important to us. And, uh, and so this past year we said, let's count people who said yes to Jesus. And so this would be a person who was either baptized, uh, a person who prayed maybe with one of our pastors to come to know Christ, uh, perhaps a person who in one of our services prayed, but the people that we became aware of who said yes to Jesus began a journey with Jesus. And that might be a person who has been away from the Lord for years but came back. But last year, through the ministry of our church, we are aware of 83 people who said yes to Jesus. That's great. And, and I think the clapping is subtle, and, and I'm subtle with you because I'm asking God to double that next year. I, I just want to see us share Jesus with people, and I want to see... I have, I have witnessed this year some of the most dramatic life transformations I've ever witnessed in my ministry. And, and I just want to see more of that happen. I want, I, I want Jesus to raise people to a life they never dreamed they could live. So let's talk about what's going on. I, I was with some pastors not long ago, and there's a guy who got up to present. And, and here's what he said. He said, during COVID, which was four years ago, by the way, 2024, that was 2020. During COVID, he said, postmodernism gained the dominant voice in American society. In other words, in his mind, he said something happened sociologically to the country. Postmodernism gained the dominant voice. We knew that that way of thinking was building, but he said during COVID, I believe, and he talked about many reasons why one was social media, Postmodernism gained the dominant voice. So, so you may say, what, what does he mean by that? And he gave three criteria. There's not an exhaustive list I'm going to put in front of you. Uh, we could talk all day about postmodernism versus Christianity. But he described it this way. He said, in postmodernism, a person is self-centered. The focus is all on me, my truth, my pleasure, my life, my happiness, but he said in Christianity, it's God-centered. Postmodern thinking would say truth is relative. I mean, it's situational. You know, it depends. In Christianity, we would say, no, truth is absolute. In fact, in Christianity, we would go so far as to say God's word is truth. I thought I might get something on that one. Is it just so cold that you don't feel like you can really participate? In, in postmodern room, most postmodernism, feelings trump truth. Or I might even say here, feelings trump scripture. I know what the Bible says, but I kind of feel this way. But in Christianity, truth trumps feelings. I'm, I may be struggling inwardly, but God's word says, and, and that's truth. Yeah. And so he said, I think what has happened is that Christians have become a bit silent. What do you do when you feel threatened? You retreat. And you turn inward. And you turn to one another for safety. I remember saying to you a year ago that, that there are times that we become tempted in the community of faith to say, you know what, it's getting a little crazy. And so maybe we should just hunker down and circle the wagons and just pray for Jesus to come quickly. The ship is always safest in the harbor anyway, right? But the problem is the ship wasn't built for the harbor. The ship was built for the open sea. And the church of Jesus Christ has God's Holy Spirit empowering them to witness. And it's not time for us to hunker down. It's time for us to rise up and share the good news of Jesus Christ with people around us. Yeah. And so we're in a series called The Call. 
When, when I begin to look at the scriptures that we are looking at during this season of Epiphany, I realize that not only is God revealing himself, making himself known, but God is also making his will known. He is, he is saying to people, I'm calling you to go. I'm calling you to do. I'm calling you to repent. Or I'm calling you to leave that behind in your life. Or I'm calling you to serve. Or I'm calling you to share Jesus with others. And so I want you to listen closely this morning, because as you do, you will hear Jesus calling you today in these words, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. You don't need another verse in the Bible to be compelled to share Jesus. This is the beginning of this conversation, and it's all you need, and I can't wait to unpack it for you in just a few moments. So, if you want to open your Bible to Mark chapter 1, we were there two weeks ago. We're back today. We're still in chapter 1. I'll remind you that John Mark wrote the gospel of Mark. He was a co-worker with Paul. He became a partner with Simon Peter in his preaching ministry, and you might remember that John Mark listened to Simon Peter tell all of the stories of his first-hand encounters with Jesus, and he listened to Simon Peter preach all of the sermons about Jesus, and we believe that that is where John Mark got all of his information to write the gospel. It's really a reflection of Simon Peter's first-hand account of the life and the teachings of Jesus. And so, I read to you early on that he starts with verse 1, this is the Good, this is the beginning, rather, of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He immediately talks about John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. And then we see that Jesus comes also to be baptized by John. Jesus' true identity is revealed in that moment. Then Jesus is led into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan. And so now after Jesus' true identity is made known, and he has been tested and proven to be true, It's time to begin his mission, his work. And he calls his followers to join him in that mission. Let me take you to John chapter 1, beginning with verse 14. Here we go. After John was put in prison, Mark chapter 1. After John, meaning John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee. Listen to this. Proclaiming the good news of God. You want to know what the good news is? The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. The time of waiting for God to intervene is over. God's new world is breaking in right now. Repent and believe this good news. And so, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and the people said, thanks be to God. I was um, this past week in Atlanta, Georgia, with a group of pastors And one day, a guy named Kevin Myers spoke to us. Kevin Myers, years ago, planted a church in Georgia called 12 Stone. It's a fascinating story. He said, we started with 104 people, and within three years, we had grown to 82 people. (laughs) And I wanted to quit. And my mentor wouldn't let me. I told him I didn't have the faith. He said, then use my faith. I've got faith. 
He said, we began to see people come to Jesus, and before long it was 300, and then 700, and then 1,000, and then 16,000 in eight campuses across that area. But he told one story that rattled me. He said, as a young pastor, I was trying to share Jesus with people and witness to people, and I wanted to help people come to know Jesus. And he said, I remember this one conversation. I got in with this guy, and I'm, I'm just trying to talk to him, and I'm making no progress. And finally, he just kind of stops me. Kevin, stop. I'm going to hell, and I've accepted it. He said, it rattled my world. I know how I'm living. I've made my choices. I'm going to hell and I've accepted it. Just stop. He said, I remember another guy a few years later in my ministry. I've been witnessing to, I've been sharing Jesus with him. And I felt like he wanted Jesus in his life and his heart desperately. And finally, one day we met because we were meeting together often. And he says, Kevin, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and, and you know that I want what you're talking about. But my wife, I talked to her about it, and, and, and she's not coming with me. And so this is the last time we're going to meet and talk about this. I've decided I'm going to hell with my wife instead of going to heaven with you. And Kevin Myers said, it shook my world. It, it rattled me. I, I, I think this morning, I'm, I'm hoping you're having the same kind of experience I had when I listened to him tell those stories. And I begin to really look into my own heart and say to myself, Rick, are you concerned? Does it rattle you? Does it shake you? That human decisions have eternal consequences. We are not universalists. We do not believe that everybody is going to heaven. And at the same time, is your heart broken for the fact that there are so many people in this world who will never be raised to this life that Jesus wants to raise them to, that they never dreamed they could live? I sat with a college kid on Friday, and he says to me, I want everybody just to taste this life that I'm living in Jesus. Does it break your heart that there's people who will never be raised to that life, that they never dreamed they could live in Christ? So Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. I, I've got to stop for a minute and just tell you that a few years ago I was in Israel and I knew we were headed north to Galilee from the region of Samaria and I was excited about getting up that way and and uh, we topped this rise, and I'm talking probably like crazy, and all of a sudden, the whole bus just goes completely quiet, and the driver slows down and pulls to the side, and, and this sight in front of me took my breath away. This is what I saw. I'd heard about it all of my life. I'd preached about it. Uh, I had never with my own eyes seen the Sea of Galilee. Here's another picture just to give you a little bit of its beauty. It's, it's 18 miles long at the longest point. It's 14 miles wide at the widest point. And Jesus is walking along, we believe, near Capernaum one day, and he sees two men, their brothers, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. And, and because we believe that God calls people, Because we believe that God taps people on the shoulder. Because we believe that God is calling every believer. I, I believe that God is calling people right now in the room. He calls these two men. And then he calls two others. It's, it's a command with a promise. What's the command? Follow me. Be my disciple. What's the promise? I will send you out to fish for people. 
Do you understand the connection of those two and how the two cannot be disconnected? This proclamation of the good news involves the mission of Jesus and the people who follow him. To be a disciple of Jesus is to fully accept him and his mission. To follow Jesus, to be a disciple, is to joining him in his mission to fish for people. The, the two cannot be disconnected. I cannot say I'm a follower of Jesus, but I don't fish. It's the only verse you will ever need in God's word to compel you to share Jesus with people. And here's my struggle. We have made discipleship about everything except fishing. We've made it about this, and we made it about this, and we made it about this, and we made it about this. We've made discipleship about everything except fishing. Well, I, I don't feel like I have the gift. I, I'm not really comfortable talking to people about faith. This is just not kind of my personality or my makeup, or I, I don't want to offend people by suggesting that they need to change their life, on and on and on. And we've just said, you know, that we've made discipleship about everything except fishing. when discipleship is about fishing. Here's the truth. It's not that you or I have intentions of disobeying Jesus. It's not that you and I don't want to be good disciples. Do you know what the truth is? The truth is we often don't know what to do or how to do it. Because in the words of one of the great, greatest voices of all times, Bob Dylan, well, there was Willie Nelson. In the words of Bob Dylan, it's because these times, they are a-changing. And, and, and what my mama did when I was a little boy by knocking on doors, it doesn't work like it worked for her. And I'm in a new world. And, and I've got to find out how today I can still be effective in sharing Jesus with people, right? So let's talk about that for a little while before we stop. David Busick, your former pastor who now serves as a general superintendent in our denomination, called me one day and he said, hey, I've met this guy. And, and I've been listening to you talk for a few months now about where God's leading you and where you feel like God's leading the church. And, and David just said, I, I think you want to meet this guy. And he's coming to town, and so let's get lunch together. And so we did. We got lunch with a guy that I met that day for the first time whose name is Daryl Kripe. And, and I told Daryl what, what I was trying to do. Well, I'm trying to get Here's what I'm doing, and I'm trying to get people in the church to come along, and, and I kind of gather in somebody with me who doesn't know Jesus, and, and, uh, and then I maybe gather in another person who does, or, or two or three people who don't know Jesus, and, and we either get together every week and we talk about a sermon, or we talk about a spiritually forming book, or we talk about a passage of Scripture, and, and it's kind of this idea of just discipling people into the faith, you know, and then discipling them through the faith. And then one day I want this person who's already in the group to lead the group, and I'm going to start another group. And he just starts shaking his head. And he says, it, it, it'll work for you. But, but the average person in your congregation, they're going to now begin leading a, a small group Bible study with people who don't know Jesus. They're probably not going to be up for that. It's a little overwhelming, I'll be honest with you. And I said, well, then what do you do? And he said, just, just back way up. What if everybody in your church just had one? What, what, what if everybody sitting in your church on Sunday morning just had one? I said, one what? He said, just one. Just one. And he said, when I say one, it could be three or four. 
And he gave me the criteria for a one. It's a person who is not a follower of Jesus. They don't profess to be Christian. They live in close proximity with you. In other words, you're able to spend time together, in-person time together. And here's the third one. You are willing to rearrange your life for them. What if everybody in your church has had one of these? Somebody who does not profess to be Christian, but they live in close proximity, and you would be willing to rearrange your life for them. Over the last several months, this is what we've been doing when we come together as a staff for a meeting. We say, let's take a few minutes and let's be accountable to one another about our one. Get in groups of two or three. And so we get in groups of two or three and somebody tells me that I work with, well, my one is this person and this is where I met them and this is the last time that I spent time with them and this is what we did. And you know what I say to them? That's good. Do it again. And then I tell them about my one, which is four. And I tell them the last time that we met and how that went and the conversations and how I'm praying. That's good. Do it again. See, some of you are looking at me right now saying, I could, I could do one. Now that I could do. This whole share. Listen. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be a witness. Your life is a witness. How are you going to really have a friend that you don't talk to Jesus about? Because if he's the center of your life, you can't help but talk about him. Once in a while, I talk about my granddaughter. I can't help it. And truly building a relationship. Truly investing in that person. Do you know what we do when your church board comes together, the leaders of the laity of this church? We say, okay, let's take a minute and talk about your one. We get in groups of two or three, and board members look each other in the eye and say, this is my one. And this is the last time I saw them, and we're going to meet again next week, and here's what we did, and here's how it went. And you know what they say to them? Good, do that again. Just keep doing that. Keep building that relationship. Jesus lives in you. That They're going to see Jesus. And at some point, you may have that conversation that says, i got to tell you my story, how I came to know Jesus. At some point, you, you, you're going to say, you, you, you're welcome to come to my church with me. I talk about it all the time. You're welcome to join me there. I want you to look back at the text. Simon and Andrew, at once, they left their nets and followed him. James and John, they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. When Jesus calls us, we leave life as we know it in order to follow him. I'm telling you, your life is about to change. Life like you've been living it, if you say, well, this is kind of my schedule, this is what I do, it's going to change. You're going to start going out of your way. You're going to change your schedule. Your prayer life is going to change. How you spend your time is going to change. To rearrange your life for your one. You, you, you might be saying, I, I just wish I had a picture of it. I, I think you hear what you're saying, but I don't know. Let me, let me give you a picture of it, okay? This is an email that I received from someone who attends our church. They said, I wanted to share something with you. This is the, the spouse writing for the two of them. Something to share with you that happened to us, okay? After hearing Daryl Kripe speak about my one. So back in the spring, Daryl actually came here, and in the atrium one night, we invited anybody who wanted to come and hear him, to come and hear him. A lot of leaders came. After hearing Daryl Kripe speak about my one, and then reading the book called Bless, you remember that sermon series? Of course, you remember all of my sermons. <laughs> but you remember bless? That's what you do with your one. B stands for what? Begin with prayer. L stands for what? What? 
Listen. E stands for eat. It's my favorite one. S stands for serve, and the other S is share your story. That, that's what you do with your one. If you're saying, what would I do with my one? That's what you do. You pray for them, you listen to them, you eat with them, you serve them, and you share your story at some point of how Jesus changed your life. And so after hearing Daryl Cripe speak about my one and then reading the book called Bless, I began to pray that God would give me a one. Didn't take long for God to answer because a few months ago we had a family move into our neighborhood. We started by taking over a small treat, welcoming them. They later brought over a treat to us. We invited them for a meal. They invited us over to their house for a meal. This friendship has blossomed over the months. I don't know how to fully express how I feel, except that God is present in every exchange we have with these people. We've never invited a neighbor to our house. But we feel that we are learning how to be hospitable in a whole different way. Most of all, we both sense a divine calling. God is fully changing us. We hope to invite them to church. But first, we want to be their friends. Pastor, it is so good to know that we can still learn more about how God wants to use us at this stage of our lives. Is that a good picture? Yeah. And so, I pray your life changes so that someone else's life can change. And there's a prayer that I've encouraged you to pray. God, bring somebody into my life today. Give me the wisdom to recognize them and the grace to open my arms to them inviting them into my life, my community, and my faith. Would you begin praying for a one? Lord, hear our prayer today and answer our prayer, I pray. Help us to see that to be a disciple is to identify with Jesus and his mission. From the very beginning, the proclamation of the good news, Jesus said, now you come with me and I'll teach you how to fish for people. Help us to never separate the two again. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Holiness Today podcast. If you enjoyed this production and wish to hear more, visit holinesstoday.org slash podcast or find us on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts.